Okay, Rabbi Sai. So, uh, everyone asked me about the title of the share, who's Shylock? We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that soon. But, uh, very good, Shakespeare, right. So, um, before I begin, I want to mention uh, three things. First of all, right now, my daughter is at her commencement, uh, her graduation uh, party. She's getting a master's in biotechnology, whatever the heck that is. And I should be there, but I decided that uh, I don't want to give up the shear, and she agreed. So this uh, shear is in honor of my daughter, who started this degree, uh, degree five, five, five years ago, five and a half years ago, after she got married. And two children in between, Baruch Hashem, right now, at this, presently, I think by Hadassah somewhere, she's getting her degree in biotechnology and masters. Good. One, two. We mentioned last week, when it comes to putting yourself in risk to save someone else, we said, Ravad Yosef said, in the name of Ridbaz, he gave very clear, uh, precise numbers. If it's 50% risk to yourself, you don't give up, it's usser. You're not allowed to uh, risk your life. If it's lower than 50%, you are obligated to give up your life. That is what Rabbi Yosef said in the name of the Baz, and I looked up the Rabbi Baz, and that's what he says. But I, I found those numbers to be very high. I found it to be like very interesting how it's so cut and dry. 50% and above, usser. You can't even volunteer. 50% and below, you have to. You're over love. But again, that's what the, that, the, the, the Rav Yosef is faithfully quoting the Rav But other Achroinim uh, have different numbers, which sit better with me. Like Rav, 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 Rav Usher Weiss says, big risk, usher to give up. Usher to even volunteer. Middle risk, you can volunteer. Low risk, you have to. It doesn't tell exactly what the numbers are. You know, I'd put it in like 50 and above, usher. 30, 20 to 50, you can volunteer. Zero to 20, you have to, right? Reb Moshe finds, that, that, that sits a little bit, that, that, that sits a little bit better with me. The numbers sound a little, uh, sits a little, a little better with me. But to say, 49%, you're mechuyim to give up, to risk your life. Again, uh, again, Reb Vad Yosef, quoting the Red Baz, Reb Baz was 500 years ago, 40 years ago, that's what he says. Uh, let's say the Reb Moshe Feinstein and Ozak Kharedim, they even have a more liberal, a liberal uh, formula. They say you never really have to give up your life. Never have to risk your life. But don't be too fastidious about it. If you see someone drowning, don't stop sitting there with a calculator. Yeah. Oh, well, let me see. I got a 0.8976 chance I'll live. No. If you see someone drowning and you think that you'll make it out, just do it. Don't be so fastidious because you wouldn't want someone to be fastidious about me. They bring Gemara's about that. So their numbers are like, it's almost like they're saying you never have to risk your life at all. But, and it's always called volunteering, but if it's low numbers, you should do it. You should do it. And, and that, that was my feeling from the Aruch HaShulchan and from the Mr. Brewer. They all quote this, don't be so fastidious, don't be so pedantic, don't be so exact. Uh, but again, like I said, Ravadi Yosef is quoting Baz, who's the earliest person that we quoted. And he says it, clear, he says, he says it the way it is. 50% usher, less than 50%, you have to. We just said that the Ridbaz says to give up a limb, which you never get back, that could be a volunteer. Because if you give up a limb, you're never going to get it back. If you risk your life, there's a good chance you'll, 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 you'll live and nothing will happen to you. But if you give up your arm or your kidney, you ain't getting it back. It ain't happening. It ain't getting it back. So we just said that that, the Ridbaz says, is, 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 is on a volunteer basis. It's a, it's a good thing to do, but it's a volunteer basis. And most Akhrenim say that. Most Akhrenim say to give up your limb, even in our days, it is it's very, very recommendable and recommendable, and you should do it, but it's considered a volunteer. Oh, that was number two. Third thing before we start to shear is I want to mention something that my uh, father wrote in his safer. A plug, a plug for my father, right? Right, my father, well, actually, my, me and my father wrote it. I mean, he wrote it, he penned it, and I typed it and edited it and brushed it up a little bit, but it's all, it's all, it's all his original thought. And he brought down, he mentioned, you know, he listened to my share, that's why we were recording this actually. He mentioned that I, I said that the Or Samech brought down 
that when the Rabbeinu Shlolem told Moshe to go to Mitzrayim, he said, don't worry, Moshe, you're safe. The, your, your, your pursuers, the people who are trying to kill you, which is basically Dachat and Aviram, they're dead. Well, not dead, they were disposed of. We know they're not dead because they show up again. <laughs> they show up again in this week's Pasha. I don't know where right? so, But they were disposed of. You don't got to worry about them. So, fine. So, from here, the Meshach and Boraraya, that if Moshe was in danger, he wouldn't have to go. Like we said, if you're in a, a real danger, 50% above, you wouldn't have to go save anyone, not even old Klai Yisrael. And therefore, Hashem had to tell Moshe, you're not in danger, so you're allowed to go. But if you, my father pointed out, uh, he brings up the Shem Arachayim, from the Arachayim, if you look at the storyline in the Chumash, it's a, it's a funny thing. Moshe by the burning bush, right? Remember the burning bush? I don't want to go, 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 I don't want to go. God said, you're going. Okay, I'm going. Moshe said, I'm going. He said, fine. Again, Moshe didn't want to go because he, not because he didn't want to save Klai's soul. He thought that he wasn't the man. He thought Aaron was the man. He just thought he wouldn't do a good job. So Moshe said, I'm going to go. Shem said, oh. Moshe goes back home. He's packing up. He's packing up. And then Hashem tells him, oh, by the way, you should know, the people who are pursuing you, are dead. Wait a minute. Moshe was already, Moshe already was, go, was going. He already agreed to go. He went back on to back up. So what's going on over here? Why does, why afterwards does Hashem tell Moshe, oh, by the way, the people are pursuing you are dead. So the Archaim says, and we're going to work with the Meshacham, it's great. Moshe, once Hashem told Moshe to go, and he said, you're the man, Moshe personally was willing to risk his life. He was willing to risk his life. He didn't need to hear that Dothan and Avirim were dead. And the Torah depicts that. The Torah brings that to four. The Moshe said, okay, I'm going. If I have to go, I'm going to go. Afterwards, Hashem says, but by the way, Moshe, I want you to know halacha. The halacha is that you really can't go if you didn't, if Dothan and Avirim wasn't dead. Because halacha is like the Moshe said, you're not allowed to risk your life in order to save other people. I mean, so it's like two things. Moshe was willing to risk his life, and the Torah depicts that. He was willing to risk his life. Afterwards, Hashem says on the side, you know, Moshe, you're going to be giving the Torah. I want you to know what the halacha is also. <laughs> so, because Moshe didn't know the halacha. Right? So that's the way my, uh, the Orchayim basically with the Meshach Chachmo. Oh, with this, my father answers, I can't go through this part. Anyone can come to me afterwards. I'll read it with you inside. It's a beautiful diukim of when Moshe called Eliezer. When did Moshe call Eliezer Eliezer? Based on Ramban and based on the Pesukim. The, way, the wording of the Pesukim. So you can come to me afterwards and we'll learn that piece inside. Okay, so now both sides. Now we're going to start this year. So, we spoke about that it's clear like day. You could give a kidney mitzvah, a great mitzvah, to give your kidney to someone else in need. Oh, fine. He said it's a volunteer, but the great mitzvah. If you make a contract, if you make a contract and say, okay, uh, I'll sell you my kidney, and there's a price, does that contract have to, have to be upheld? Do you have to uh, respect that contract? Or is a contract called null and void automatically? Can you make a contract with someone to sell him your kidney? He'll give you $200,000, that's the going price nowadays, whatever the going price is. Is that contract considered binding? Could the seller back out? Could the buyer back out? Could the donor back out? Could the recipient back out? Could no one back out? Could he back out even after he got the, the, the kidney and say, well, sorry, I'm not paying you because there's, there's nothing binding here. That is what we're going to probably not get to today, but that's what we're going to try to get to. All right, so it's a really a chayshim mishpat type of question. That's really what this is, okay? And Mir Tashem will get to the, probably next year, the ethical parts about it, the moral issues about it. Oh, so there's a famous, famous rabbi, Rabbi Zevin, right? Very famous. Rabbi Shlomo Sh 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 Yosef Zevin. He was whatever you want him to be. He was a Chabad. He was a Zion. He was well read. He was also, the major thing was that he was a, a huge, 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 he was a big writer, prolific writer, an editor. Wh whatever you want, the man was it. He, Avbez did everything. He was everything. Uh, so he's like in everyone's captain. The Yainim love him, and the Chabad love him, and the Hasidim love him. Everyone loves him because he's everything. Uh, but he was a, the, the main thing was that he's a major league Tamachacham. A major league Tamachacham. And he wrote a whole, a very famous piece on the Merchant of Venice, right? 
you know, if I was in Bristol, I'd say Merchant of Venice, I wanna, but you guys are all sophisticated, so you all know from Shakespeare, and you know from the Merchant of Venice, right? So, who was Shakespeare? Right, the bard, right? The most, uh, probably the most famous writer ever. So there's a lot of conspiracies about, about Shakespeare. Some people say that he didn't even write anything. He was a, he was a in, in, in Presario, he was really the, just the manager of the, uh, of the uh, theaters, and it was a woman who wrote everything. <laughs> but uh, that, 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 that wouldn't fly, so they put his name in all his plays. No. But no. But the biggest conspiracy, which is a, the, 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 a, the, a lot of scholars believe, that he was Jewish, that he was a crypto Jew. He was a crypto Jew, and that's why a lot of his plays know a lot about, about Judaism. And what was his last name, really? Shapiro. It wasn't William Shakespeare. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not making this up. His it's first name like Shapiro because it came from a spire. It came from a town spire. The, anyway, and his real name was Shapiro, and therefore anyone who has a last name Shapiro, maybe they can refer to uh, their Zayda, William Shakespeare, William Shapiro. Maybe that's why Ben Shapiro is such a good speaker, but so glib. You know, maybe. Anyway, be that his name. I did not make it up. There are literally hundreds of books written about this issue. Whether who, who wrote Shakespeare, was he Jewish, was he not Jewish? They got the same thing about Columbus, the he Jewish and not Jewish? The kids are. So, is, was he anti-Semitic? Was he, a, help, was he, a, was he a, a self-hating Jew if he's Jewish? Well, if you ask me, if you ever read Merchant of Venice, I would read, I, I would read, some people don't read it that way, but I would read that he was anti-Semitic. Why? Because what's the story? We all know the story. There was a guy named Antonio. Antonio needed a loan. Why? Antonio is a Christian because a guy named Bassanio, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Bassanio wanted a loan because he wanted to court some woman and he needed a lot of money to take her out for lunch or whatever. And Antonio said, oh, I'll lend you the money, but uh, I don't really got any money. So Antonio said, go to Shylock. Shylock is a Jew, is a money lender. Jews are famous for being money lenders in the good old days because that was the only job they were allowed to have. And I presume Shylock was religious, he was a Hasidic, obviously, because before the Hasidic movement, Shakespeare lived before the Hasidic movement. But, but I presume he, he, he had a, 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 a firm appearance. And Shylock said to Antonio, yeah, I'll sure I'll lend you the money, no problem. But if you can't pay back, you got to give me a pound of flesh. Right? Basically, he would die, right? So Antonio said, no problem. Let me the money. Now, why did Shylock do that? Because he didn't like Antonio, because Antonio was always made, always made a lot of anti-Semitic remarks to him. So he, wanted, he was hoping that Antonio would default, and then he would really default, and he would lose a part of his body. Okay, that's the story. So what happens? Sure enough, right? So Shylock is depicted by this guy who wants to take uh, Antonio's uh, a pound of flesh. And of course, in the middle of the story, uh, Shylock's daughter uh, elopes with some Christian guy. Her name is Jessica. You know, a little, a little like fiddle on the roof over there. You know, Shylock's daughter runs away and elopes. Anyway, what happens at the end of the day? Sure enough, Antonio can't pay the loan because his ships got. He was hoping to get a big deal from from ships, and ships got the lost at sea. So they go to the court in in, uh, in in Venice, and the judges say, "Yeah, yeah, sorry, Antonio, you gotta." Shylock, Shylock, he made a deal with Shylock, so you gotta cut a, Shylock could cut out a pound of, uh, of, of, of your flesh, right? So the, the, and the outside people came and said, no, we'll pay the loan. And uh, Shylock said, no, I don't, a deal's a deal, I don't want money from anyone else. And basically, Mr. Poor Antonio over there is about to get carved by Shylock. Shylock is there with his knife, his machete about to carve, He's all very happy there, all uh, uh, very uh, gleaming there. Oh, all of a sudden comes a man named Portia. Well, they didn't know it was a man. It was really a woman. It was really a woman. Her name was Portia. And she's another character in the story. And she advocates for Antonio and it says, like a real alumna. She says, well, look at the contract. It says you could only take a pound of, of, of flesh. That means without blood, you can't take any blood. Uh, if you cut it, if you cut, right, it's, it's alumna. <laughs> and you cut out a pound of flesh, no, he's going to bleed too. And you know, and, and that, that was in the contract. And the venerable judges in the court said, wow, you're right. This, <laughs> this contract is not binding. And they said, since Shylock tried to uh, fool the court, so he had to get punished, he had to give up all his money, and he had to become Christian to boot. And that's the end of the story. Right? That's the end of the story. So Antonio is like, I don't know, that doesn't sound too 
favorable for the Jews, right? So, like, the, 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 fam the famous line in that play is, have not Jews eyes, organs? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? So it says Shylock, why he wanted to take uh, Antonio's flesh, right? This is, a, this is a case, this is a, right? At the end of the day, that lawyer was actually a girl. Her name was Portia, she dressed up as a man. A whole story over there with a ring. Read the book. Read the book if you want, okay? Read the play. You know, uh, Shakespeare, is, it's not so much the plot that's important, it's, it's the words that he used. That, 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 that's, that's the goddess of Shakespeare. Be the debate. The question that Sir Rabbi Zevin, who we said uh, was quite well read, he wants to know, is that contract uh, upholdable in, in uh, the Jewish court? Let's say Shylock and Mr. Antonio went to a Jewish court. What would the Jewish court say about such a contract? That's what Rabbi Zevin has like a, a 30 page essay, a 30 page essay on this issue. Okay? So, first he starts off with, he, first he gets off on a technicality. First he deals with the sugya of asmachta, which is really not so much our issue, that you know when you make a, when you make a contract and it's so bizarre, and the contract is contingent on something, like for example, I, uh, I'll lend you money, I'll lend you the money, and I say, oh, if you don't pay back, you gotta uh, give me a billion dollars, and you gotta uh, jump off high 10,000 times, right? So the law is that um, such a contract is not valid, because we say that since it's so bizarre, and it was based on a uh, hedging, it was based on a bet, that contract is automatically not that uh, valid, because the guy who made the contract never thought it would actually come to fruition. So here too we can say Antonio never thought he couldn't pay. And therefore, even though he couldn't pay, he didn't really mean it that he didn't pay. You could take off his, uh, you could take a pound of his flesh. Okay. But, Rabbi Zevin points out that even in a case of a smachta, there are ways to make it binding. We, if you learn Bab and Sia, which we did, right? We learned in the night Bab and Sia, it talks about there are ways to make it smart to bind them. If you write a certain language to the star, you say, me achshav, you say, you make a very emphatic statement from now, right? from now, I'm obligating myself. And if you do it in front of a bezdin choshuv, if you make the contract in front of a bezdin choshuv, then no matter how far fetched the contract is, even if it's in a smachta, it is called a bind. It's called that you have to uphold the uh, terms. So, just to make life easier, we can, if Antonio and, and uh, what's the name, uh, Shylock, made the contract to avoid the issue of Asmachta, for example, they did Me'achshav, they did Nebed Nechashiv, they did both, they wrote Me'achshav and Nebed Nechashiv, so still, would the contract be uh, uh, valid or not? Oh, so then he says, then he says, well, seemingly, seemingly he says, that no, there's something fundamentally wrong with this contract, and therefore the contract is not binding. What's fundamentally wrong with this contract? Because that's clear like day, you can't make a contract against the Torah. I can't make a contract with uh, Jonathan, uh, I'm going to work for you on Shabbos, or something like that. I can't do that. I can never make a, a, a monetary deal that contravenes, that goes straight up against the Torah. Okay, they say fine, right? So where does it say in the Torah that you can't take off someone's flesh? Where does it say that in the Torah, the public that says, do not take someone's flesh? Uh, the answer is, in fact, yes, in fact, yes. It does say in the Torah, an open love in the Torah, you're not allowed to hit someone. If you hit someone, you are over a love. Where does it say in the Torah? It says in the parashas keep saying, say. it says over there openly that when you're giving someone Malchus, it says you only got to give 39. And the Torah says, and if, you better be careful that it should only be 39. Pen Yosef. Make sure you don't add on to it. Make sure you don't give a 40th. So from there we learn, if you hit someone, you are chayev alav. And in principle, you are chayev malchus if you hit someone. Now, it could be if you hit someone, if, it's, uh, if you damage him, you'll be paying money. So if you pay money, you never get 
you never get uh, double punishment. So therefore, you'll pay money, not get malchus. But let's say you hit someone and that person has no loss. You just hit him, but he didn't go down in value. Then you get malchus. So it depends. It could be you get malchus when you hit someone. Or it could be you get, uh, it could be you pay money. It depends on how badly you hurt the guy. The beat of the main, it's a insert laugh to hit someone. So seemingly, our friend Shylock over here made a contract that's against the Torah. Right? And even if Antonio, he goes, he goes involved, if Antonio was not Jewish, so maybe you could hit a, a, a guy. He says, not true, you can't hit a guy either. It's not clear if you have a love, but definitely the Sarbal Achaim. So basically, says Reb Zevin, there is no way that this contract is valid because you can't hit someone. So just think you make a contract with Michal Shabbos. You can't make a contract with do Avodah Zorah. You can't make a you can't make a contract to be over a Dindaraisa. Okay. Oh. And the truth is, uh, if you look at a rush and the rush put in the Shulchan Aruch, it says uh, something similar. So let's say you make a contract, and you make a contract. You say, uh, if I don't pay you the loan, I'll become an I'll be an Eved Ivri. You're right. You make a contract like that. If I don't pay the loan, I'll be an Eved Ivri. So says the Rosh and the Shulchan Aruch, that, that's not valid. Why? Because in our days, there's no such thing as an Eved Ivri. First of all, an Eved Ivri is only when you steal something and you can't pay back. Second of all, in our days, there's no Eved Ivri. Why in our days, there's no Eved Ivri? Because it's contingent on Yevon. And there's no Yevon nowadays. There is Eved Kanani nowadays. You could have an Eved Kanani nowadays. But you cannot have an Eved Ivri nowadays. So, uh, so, what do you see from the Rosh? You just can't make, you just can't make a, a contract about your body. That's the point. You can't make contact about your body uh, that contravene uh, 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 what the Torah says. The Torah says you cannot be negative free. So, you just can't make a contract against it. The Torah says someone is not allowed to hit you. You can't go against the Torah. Oh. Oh. This is what we see from the Rosh. Then he talks about the uh, debtors' prisons. But that's the point. Oh. So, what we're trying to bring out over here, what Zevin is trying to bring out is, you don't own your body. You don't own your body. And since you don't own your body, and the Torah says someone can't hit you, you can't say, well, I let you hit me. I let you hit me. Right? I know there's a lot of pen, uh, pen Yosef. But maybe if I tell someone hit me, so it's my body. The Kiddush is, the Rebbe Zevin is bringing out, no, it's not your body, it's God's body. And you can't tell someone, you can't tell someone to hit you. Let's say you have a car, can you tell someone to burn the car down? Yes, you can. You can tell someone to burn the car down, it's your car. Why not? Forget the issue about Tosca. But uh, in principle, yeah. You can tell someone, to, to, you can give someone all your money, you can give them whatever you want. Because that you own. And then you can do what you want. You can do what you want. But your body, you don't own. And since you don't own, and the Torah says that someone hits you, you're over love, you can't tell that person, hit me. I give you Rishos. Give me your best. Give me your best shot. No, no. You can't do that because you don't own your body. And say, that's a rush thing also. You can't say, I'll be an Evan What do you mean you'll be an Evan You can't make yourself an Evan Only it's very, uh, it's very, um, there are certain uh, conditions that have to be met. And you don't own your body to make yourself an Evan if those conditions are not met, you just can't say, yeah, but so what? I want to be an Evan No. An Evan is basically you, you are owned by the person. You can't do that. Oh. Now, the seemingly, we have a Gemara that says not like this. That's what the shirt's going to be about. Do you own your body or not? This is what it's about. So, seemingly, we have a Gemara not like this. Why do we have a Gemara not like this? Because the Gemara in openly in Baba Kama, well, not so openly, but we derive from the Gemara Baba Kama that if you tell someone, Cut off my limbs. You tell someone, cut off my limbs, and I promise you I won't charge you. Or you tell someone, hit me, and you, and, and you, and you promise you won't, uh, you won't charge him. The Gemara says, if he does it, he's putter. The Gemara says that depending on the language, depending on how you word it, but if we know you mean business, they say, go ahead, I want you uh, to, to cause me pain. I'm a, I'm a masochist, and you have to be a sadist. It all works out. Go ahead, hit me. So, so, uh, so uh, you don't got to pay. So how you see from there, what I said is not true. You see, yeah, the Torah says 
someone to now like hit you, he's over a lot. But if you give him permission, no problem. Just like if you give permission, to someone to take you away your house, or you could give someone your presents. Someone could tell someone to burn your your, your car. Oh, but the Shulchan Aruch Harav, who's the Shulchan Aruch Harav? The Balatanya, right? He didn't just write the the tie. He was like a, a major, 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 major Talmud Chacham, right? So the uh, Shulchan Aruch Harav and the Rivosh, with ready a Rishon, say, no, 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 no. You have to you have to buy 4K. No, no, no. All the Gemara Baba Kama it means is if you tell someone to hit you, even though you're not allowed to do that, and if that guy hits you, he's over a lav, but you can't ask for money. Why not? Because the second he hits you, it's like you said, since you said, hit me, the second he hits you, he's chayiv, but that second you're Michael. So, in, in the money aspect, the Gemara Baba Kama says, if you let someone hit you, he's not chayiv. He doesn't mean you're not. The guy's chayiv Malkus. The guy's a Russia. And you're not a very good guy either. But money you can't extract from him. Because since you gave him permission, so the second he hit you, it's like whatever he owes you, you are Michael him. So so says the Shulchan Aruch Harav, and so says the. Um, let me quote for you the Shulchan Aruch Harav. I feel even if you get permission, You don't own your body. You can't give someone permission to hit you. not to embarrass you. Wow. So he's pretty adamant about this. Okay, great. So back to square one. Great. That's what we're saying. You don't own your body. So since you don't own your body, you can't tell someone to hit you. And you can't sell your kidney because you don't own your body. So you can't tell that you don't own. Can I sell your kidney? No. Because I don't own it. I don't own my kidney either. I definitely can't tell it. So it's not binding. Okay? Oh. Oh. But, like I said, there's no open Gemara like this. On the contrary, the Gemara seems to apply. You could be Michael. And we're sort of like saying... It means you come with Michael, that if he hits you, you, don't, you can't ask for money. So we're, we're sort of reading into the Gemara. Oh. The truth is, the Michas Chinech, who's the Michas Chinech? The Zayda. The Zayda actually argues. The Zayda, the Zayda says, you're wrong, Shulchan uh, you know, He says, he, he, he disagrees. He says that if you tell someone to hit you, not only does the guy not have to pay money, he also is not chayv a lot. He's not chayv a lot. If you give, if someone, if I tell Jonas and you can hit me, he's allowed to do it. There's no love, there's no nothing, because what does Michael Chinech hold? He holds not to what we're saying. He holds, you own your body. And it's just like you can tell someone to hit your car, you can tell someone to hit you, because you own your body. And the whole love is only talking when a guy does it illegally. If does it illegally, then you get the love. Okay? So according to the Minchet Chinech, seemingly you could sell your kidney. Because according to the Minchet you own your body. So if you own your body, you can sell your kidney. So according to the Shulchan Aruch Harav, you can't sell your kidney because you don't own it. According to the Minchet Chinech, you could sell your kidney because you do own it. Oh! Oh. Now Rebbe Zevin uh, does not side with the Minchet Chinech. Uh, so we're going to go with Rebbe Zevin right now. And... He brings the Gemara from Sanhedrin, which is a pretty, pretty solid question on the Mechat uh, there'll be The Gemara says like this. We know you now hit your father. What happens if you hit your father? God forbid. Chai Misa. But we, we, but we all know, we all are makis, we all know every time the Torah says an onish, it has to be coupled with a love. Right? Every ownership of the Torah always has to say, has to have a lav with it. I mean, the Torah say, uh, uh, if, you uh, if you live with your mother, you get killed. But the Torah has to say somewhere else, you now live with your mother. That's why we have Kedoshim and Achimais. It seems like it's, rep it's repetition. It talks about all the riots. But one place saying don't do, and one place is saying the, 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 um, the punishment, right? It's everyone in the knows this, right? That's called what? That's everything. No, no. Uh, we're not looking at now. We'll be here all day. Every pun, yeah, any, right. every bodily punishment, every bodily punishment has to have a love behind it. So 
it is true when you hit your dad, God forbid, you're Chayv Misa, but what's the lav? What's the Azara? Same Hazara, Pen Yosef. There's no different lav, the warning that you have for your dad and the same warning you have for everyone else. It's just if you hit everyone else, you get Malchus. Or pay money, depending on what the story is. When you hit your dad, you happen to be Chayv Misa. Okay? Now, what does it say in the Gemara? The Gemara says, are you allowed to uh, be a, are you allowed to doc, are you allowed to uh, bloodlet for your dad? Right in the good old days, the bloodletting was a common thing to do. Are you allowed to do it? So the Gemara says, the Gemara says, um, you could do it because it brings a plastic for a fool, for a fool. You're allowed, you're allowed to, uh, for a fool, you are allowed to uh, wound your dad. And then the Gemara says that Rav and Marbre Davino wouldn't let their sons blood lead or take out a uh, thorn. The Gemara says, why? Because maybe they'll overdo it. Maybe, maybe by accident, when they take out the thorn, they'll prick him somewhere else by accident. So the Gemara says, so then any doctor shouldn't any doctor shouldn't do any type of procedure because maybe he'll make a mistake. The Gemara says, you're right, you know, the mistake is a Chicago, so, you know, we don't got to worry about it. But for a son to make a mistake on his dad, that's really bad because, you know, if you, if you hit your dad, you chive me, so, 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 what, so, so, so let's go to the Gemara again. The Gemara says, step eight, are you allowed to uh, bloodlet you for your father? Are you allowed to do a, a, a medical procedure for your father? The Gemara says, yeah, we bring the special source. Wait one cop to pick a second. According to Michas Chinuch, what, what, what do you need a source? According to the Michas Chinuch, if you get permission, the whole law doesn't apply. The law of Pen Yosef does not apply. What do you need a special source that you allow to do a medical procedure on your father? Of course, he gave you permission. And what's the next Gemara? The next Gemara says, the, 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 the rab, uh, the, these are uh, Amarayim, Rav, and Maranita said, you know, son, don't do it because maybe by accident you'll hurt me. So what? So what by accident? If you gave permission, you gave permission. Tell, tell the son, do the best you can. And if you hit, if by accident you prick me an extra time, I'm Michael. And the Gemara asks the same question. And what, don't mean, the Gemara says, and what about any doctor? How can he do anything for anyone? You're right, it's a problem, but, but it's a bigger problem by your father. But what do you see from this Gemara? If the concept of Pen Yosef wouldn't apply when you have a Rishus, this Gemara makes no sense. We, we don't need a special dispensation by your fool for the father. The father gave permission. You don't have to worry about, maybe you'll do it by accident. Maybe there's something wrong by accident. He gave permission. So from here, up, Zevin and many others prove like, like Rabbi Zevin said, you don't own your body. You don't own your body. You can't give permission. There's no such thing as giving permission. So we need a special puzzle to tell you, but for a fool, you're allowed to do it. For a fool, you're allowed to do it. And out can they kach, if you do a refuah, but you mess up, you, you, the, 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 um, the splinter was here, and by accident, you also did here. You, that's it, you did it over there. But shaykik. Nothing you can do about it. But you did another error. I, the guy gave you permission. Yeah, he gave you permission. But it, there's no, there is no hetero of refuah. There's no, no hetero of, no heta of mechila. It's only hetero of refuah. You didn't do refuah. You did it over here by accident. So, oh, the truth is, the Michel Chinech knew about this Gemara. <laughs> Trust me, he knew about the Gemara. And he himself understands that he's a problem with the Gemara. But he gives a very, very difficult answer. He says, of course, if the father gives you permission, you can do what you want. If someone else gets permission, you can do what you want. You can beat him up, do what you want. This comes so much where the father is unconscious. He never gave you permission. The father is unconscious. He didn't give you permission. So it's talking, are you allowed to do a medical procedure on an unconscious father? Oh, he didn't give you shush. Why did he give you shush? Because the father is unconscious. And this is how the day the, the Michal Chirik gets out of it. But the, I can't get involved. The Gemara does not seem that way. Because the Gemara says that they were awake. He says, Rav wouldn't let his son take out a splinter. Uh, Rav wouldn't let, the, the Ravina wouldn't let the, his son um, uh, empty out a, a pus. Uh, there was a, he had some pus. 
Anyway, the Mikhail Levy gets out, tries to get out of that too. He also tries to get out of that too. He tries to get out of that too. The bottom line is the simple reading of the Gemara. The simple reading of the Gemara is like Reb Zevin and like the Shulchan Aruch Harav that you have no, no concept of being Michael someone to hit you. You cannot get rid of the law. And only by Rafua, we have special looking for Rafua. That's what we're looking for, our Rafua. Oh. Now, the truth is, you know, this Gemara, the Mikhil Chinuch, tries to get out of. I mean, there's an open Gemara that it, it, it's almost, I, I can't see how the Mikhil Chinuch gets out of this problem. The Gemara, black and white, it's a Mishnah. It's a Mishnah in Baba Kama. The Mishnah Baba Kama says, a person ain't Adam Rishai Lechabal Es Atzma. A person does not have permission to damage himself. That's an open mission of Baba Kama. In a chayvul. The Gemara says, What well, your potter? The Tais of the course, you potter. Who are you going to pay yourself? That's a, it's a little interesting. Ain't Adam Rishai Lechabal Es Atzma, but he doesn't need potter. Well, who are you going to pay yourself? And if someone else damages you, you're ch- he's chayvul. And the Gemara's here. The Gemara says, how do you know a person can't damage himself? And it brings the famous Gemara that it says that every Nazar is a chayta. Rabbi Lazar says every Nazar is a chayta. Why is every Nazar called a sinner? Because he abstained from wine. And God don't like you abstaining for no good reason. Okay? That's the Gemara's here. That famous Gemara that you don't just... You just, just can't deprive yourself of seeing for no good reason. And we're talking, I can't get involved there, trying to get involved there. But basically, the nether should not deprive himself of wine, and that's why it's called a chayte, and that's why it's to be a cover Wait, wait, so what do you think of that Kamar? It's black and white, you can't hurt yourself. Now, what does that mean, you can't hurt yourself? So you want to, like, you know, scratch yourself or something? You know, that's what it means, you can't. Well, I understand, you give, you've been sure giving permission to yourself. You've been sure giving permission to yourself, you're doing it. So what do you see? You see black and white, you don't own your body. How could the Mikhil Shinnik say, I can give you permission to hit me, but I can't do it to myself? How, how could it be? Now, this is Reb Zevin's very, 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 very strong argument against the Mikhil Shinnik. I, mean, I can think of a way out of it, but simply speaking, this is a very, very strong argument. If it says you can't hurt yourself, obviously you can't give permission to someone else to hurt you, because when you hurt yourself, you're automatically giving yourself permission, right? So Reb Zevin, again, is proving you don't own your body. It ain't yours. You can't sell it. You can't let someone hit you. It doesn't, impossible, not yours. It's on loan. It's on loan from God at best, at best. Oh. Right? So it, some more sources for this. The, uh, the, uh, the Rambam in uh, Hilchis Ritzayach, of course, the Rambam in Hilchot Ritzayach says that, listen to his language, a murderer, you got to kill a murderer, even if he's willing to give you all the money in the world. So the murderer comes to court and says, listen, Bezdin, don't murder me. I'm going to support all of Torah jewelry. I'm going to pay everyone the title check. I'm going to support all the yeshivas. Everything we don't need, we don't have to write every single thing, right? And even if the relatives say, Ah, oh, leave him alone, so the, he's gonna give a, a huge check to the yeshivas, and the relatives say, Leave him alone, we still kill the murderer. The reason why we're killing the murderer is because he stole from God. Stole from God? He, what do we stole from God? The murderer killed a, someone who got murdered. Who is the victim? Larry, right? Larry's the victim. What does God got to do with this? What does Robert say? You, can't, you have to kill the murderer. No money in the world. No, even if, if, even if the, the relatives of Larry say, leave him alone. You got to kill the murderer. Why? Because the, the murder victim, the victim is not owned by anyone. He's not owned by the relative. He's owned by God. Owned by God. What do you see from here? Black and white, Rabbi Zevin is saying. 
You know what's the problem when you kill someone? When, that, when, 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 when someone kills Larry? It's not about Larry. It's about you, you just stole from God. You stole from God. You took, a, you took a life as it was from God. And therefore you can't write any check for it. And you can't, no one could be mochel, because God said he's not mochel. But here's black and white. When he, God is the owner of the body, right? Now, what is the most famous thing that we always say in the yeshivas? I, 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 I myself must have told this a hundred times. We know it is a famous din that if you go to court and you say, Oi, I owe a thousand dollars to Moishi. The court says, yeah, why? I borrowed, I stole, I bought, I didn't pay. What's the law? Hadoiz baldin kemein dummy. If you in court say you owe money, but not a present. You say you owe money, you gotta pay. Even though there's no aid in, and even though you're related to yourself, Hadoiz baldin kemein dummy. You can't retract. Once you say it, you're, you're stuck. But we all know that if you go into court, and you say, Bezdin, I'm a sinner. I was Michal Shabbat. I did have Odazara. And you know what? I did kill Arias too. Kill me, please, Bezdin. What do we say? Go home, have a nice day. We're going to give you Shlishi. We're going to. You know, we don't. Why not? What is the difference? What is the difference that we say, Hadoy's Bazdin can be a dummy? But when, when it comes to uh, corporeal punishment, when it comes to a bodily punishment, we don't believe you. So who asked this question? The Rambam. Now, the Rambam gives a very interesting answer. A very interesting answer. He says, Why? Amazing. He says, maybe he's suicidal. A guy comes into court and says, kill me because I was Michal Shabbos. Kill me because I didn't have a Zara. We're afraid the guy just wants to end his life. <laughs> Maybe he's from the depressed um, uh, has melancholy. They want to die. Shame Tom and Taiki Chabad And they're always throwing themselves off. They're always throwing themselves off uh, the roofs. So this guy said, you know what? I don't really got the guts to throw myself off the roof. I'll let Bezin do it. Did that, right? That's, that's an interesting reason. The Rambam says, why is it that you can't come to court and say, you Machal Shabbos, kill me, I did a very bizarre. We're, we're, we're thinking you try to commit suicide. And you don't have the guts to do it yourself, so you want to like do it, maybe get, do it like a big, uh, big bang and best in, you know, be a little bit exciting, make the news, you know. That's an amazing reason. Close to the Then the Rambam says, you know what, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cost it, so whatever the reason is, whatever the reason is. Oh, that's the Rambam news. They're in Baz, Famously says, you know what the reason is? It's exactly what we're saying now. Exactly what we're saying now. You have money. Could you burn it? You could burn it. You could do whatever you want your house. You want to burn your house down? Forget about the Baltasha issue. But in principle, you could do whatever you want. You can give your house away, you can give your money away, you can do whatever you want, right? So says the says the Red Baz, when you come to court and say, Bezin, I owe a thousand dollars because I stole or I, I borrowed. Okay. We believe you. You can do whatever you want with the money. So, right? But when you come to court and say, kill me, you don't own your body. When you come to court and say, hit me, I get Malchus, let me have it. Right? Right? Self-flagellation. We say, what do you mean? You, you, you can't believe you. You're not different than any, you're no different than any eight echad. You're no different than any eight echad. Because you don't, you don't have the propriety, you don't have the ownership of your body. So you can't say, hit me, I'm Chayv Malkus, buy money, since you can do what you want with your money. So if you say that you owe, we believe you. But when it comes to your body, it's like talking about a third party. Can I come to court and say, oh, he was Michal Shabbos with one aid? No, of course not. So this is the Rebaz. Again, we're seeing another, uh, uh, another proof. We're adducing from the Rebaz this concept. You don't own your body. You can't sell your body. You can't let someone hit you. You can't give reshus. You can't tell Bezdin, uh, beat me up. I'm Chai, I'm Chai Malkus. Oh, okay. Now, the truth is, the Minchis, <laughs> the truth is, the Minchis Chinech is Lushi Tosoi. The Minchis Chinech is Lushi Tosoi. Because the Minchis Chinech says something quite fascinating. 
He says, we all, we, the last two shows were about saving someone's life. Saving someone's life. You got to do what you can. Maybe even anything less than 50%, you got to even risk your life. Even take 50% risk, we said maybe. Point to Rebbe. You got to save someone's life. Says the Mikhas if someone is committing suicide, you don't got to save his life. Unbelievable. Mikhas says, you see some guy drowning and he saw that he jumped in on purpose? On purpose. You don't got to save his life. He proves this from the Gemara because the Gemara compares a saving someone's life by Shiva Saloy, a saving someone's money. But just like we know if someone just randomly throws his money out on the street, even if he's not masquerading. We'll learn next month. Let me see. If you randomly throw your money out the street, you don't got to save it for him. There's no dinner of, of Matsya. So if someone wants to commit suicide, you don't got to save them. That's what the Bichas Ginnach says. Unbelievable. And then, and then maybe you don't have to Michal Shabbos. They're not going to go there. If someone commits suicide, you don't go to Michal Shabbos. <laughs> if you're not supposed to save him, you don't go to Michal Shabbos to save him. All right? So what is that? We see the Bichas Ginnach is Lishi Tosoi. The Bichas Ginnach holds. You own your body. So if you own your body, you can tell someone to hit you, and then there's no law, because you own your body. You gave someone permission. Yeah, without permission, there's no law. And since Michael says, if you commit suicide, maybe it's not, it's not a good thing to do, but bottom line is, you own your body, so you gave it up, so I don't got to save you. Again, it's, it's very complicated, because everyone holds if you commit suicide, you owe your love. That's not that, that everyone holds. If you if, 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 no question, you're not allowed to commit suicide. So it's a very subtle point. When the Mishnah is saying, you, you, you're not allowed to kill yourself. That's an outside lav. That's an outside problem. But in principle, you own your body. So if you decide to give it up, someone else has got to try to save it for you. Okay? So don't come out and say, oh, Rabbi Fine said you're allowed to commit suicide. According to, according to the Zayd, you're allowed to commit suicide. That's not what the Mishnah is saying at all. The Mishnah is saying, since you own your body, if you don't want it, someone else doesn't have to save it. Even though you are, it's illegal for you to kill yourself, but it's a side reason that it's illegal. Not because you don't own it. Uh, you, you know, you own your body too, but you can't eat chazer. A lot of things a lot of things you can't do, even though you own your body, right? You can't think of your pain, right? So what the Bishnah is saying, that the suicide, the reason why you can't commit suicide, is not because you don't own your body. You own it. That's a side reason. So therefore, Bishnah is going to hold, if you try to commit suicide, someone else doesn't have to save you. Just like if someone throws his money out the door, you don't got to try to give it back to him. Okay? Oh, now. But the bottom line is, it's Lashitasa, that you own your body. Oh. Oh. On this, all the Akhrainim go to town, and they all go to town. They, and they all say the same thing. They're very, very adamant against the Mishnah. The Mishnah, everyone, everyone, everyone. Ridiculous. You don't own your body. You can't commit suicide, not only because of the law. You can't commit suicide because the, the law is a, re is a revelation. You don't own your body. So, yes, if I take uh, my uh, watch and just throw it randomly on the street, someone doesn't got to return it to me. Even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't Mafka, because I own it, and I don't seem to care too much about it. So, you don't care about it, something's got to return it to you. But if you commit suicide, it don't make no difference that you don't care about it. It's irrelevant that you don't want to live, it's irrelevant that you don't care about it because it's in your body anyway. It's God's body. And you have no jurisdiction. It's not in your bailiff. It's not in your purview. It's not, it's not, it's not under your... Um, it's, not, it's not your right for you to decide, I don't want it. So everyone, Ramosha, everyone says this mission is wrong. And if someone's committing suicide, you mechal Shabbat to save him. You see someone committing suicide, you mechal Shabbat to save him. Mechal Shabbos. That's a big thing, Mechal Shabbos. Why? Because it make a difference. That committing suicide is nothing. He doesn't own his body. He has no right to, to his body. And therefore, what he's doing is irrelevant. Okay? Oh. Oh. Uh, uh, euthanasia? What? Euthanasia? What do you mean? You know, you're, 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 like, you're, someone's telling you to pull the plug on them. You have to, like, obligate. Like, you have to obligate. Okay. Them. Good, 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 good. See me? Seemingly, yes. But we're not going there. Let's, let's, not, go, let's not go there. It's just too complicated right now. The bottom line is, if we have to set it up, we have the Zayde, the Minchas Chinuch, who says, you own your body, and according to him, you could sell your kidney. If you could sell someone to hit you, and there's no problem, and, and, and that, that, that gets rid of the lot, you can sell your kidney. According to Rabbi Zevin, 
and many others, you can't sell your kidney because you don't own your body, you don't own your kidney. So you, it's like you're selling not, it's like you're selling someone else's uh, car or something. Oh, now, where are we holding? 50? Rabbi side. We have not even started yet. I'll just say one or two more things. We'll then have to continue next week. Uh, I think we can talk about k kidney until the end of the month. So, uh, you know, yeah. Reb Zevin uh, brings, whenever you learn Baba Kama, this is like the number one, one of the number one questions is, so you, you, you blinded someone, what do you pay? What do you pay when you blind someone? You pay, what is, what is his worth on the slave market? Has it ever Kanani, right? And everyone asks, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, that's true when someone was, let's say, uh, uh, a slave is, is worth, with two eyes is worth, let's say, $100,000, with one eye is worth $70,000, yeah. But you know what? There's a lot more to an eye than using it to work. You know? A beautiful, you use your eye to see things. You use your ear to hear music. That is not, it, that is not in the equation. An Ebu Kanani, his price has nothing to do with the fact that, well, the Ebu could see and enjoy a, 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 a Picasso picture or whatever, could enjoy a Rembrandt. All right? Or could uh, enjoy Bach. So, so what do you tell me? I take off some of Someone takes some eye, pay thirty thousand dollars, and I went down. What, what about the fact that the guy can't see anymore? He can't see. He can't see his children. He can't see his uh, uh, a beautiful sunset. He can't hear if he took off his ear. What's going on over this, right? Oh. So Rabbi Zevin says that's exactly the point. Those things you don't gotta pay for, cause the guy don't own it. When you took away the guy's eye, you didn't take it away from him. You took it away from God. The only thing you did take away from him is what he could have turned into money. That we consider you took away from him because that is something uh, tangible. That is something empirical, something that you have, you have your sight, you have your arm, whatever it is, that can be translated into money. That we consider you do own. That is you do own. But everything around your eye, which is the main thing that you could see and you could enjoy seeing, sight, that you don't own. So that's why Reb Zevin says, that's a shot. You don't pay, you pay such a small amount when you damage someone, someone's eye. Because you don't own that eye. You don't own that. It's on loan from God. The Kiddush is, that's a Kiddush. We'll still talk, that what you could, what that you could monetize, that, that, that this that you were able to turn into money, that we see you do own. That's something that you have, that you have in your, that's something that God, that you do have. The Kiddush. Oh. The truth is, the Rambam has a whole different take about, because, maybe because of this question. He actually looks totally different than the Rambam. Okay, everybody say, where are we holding? Okay, everybody say, it's going to take way too long. A good speaker knows when it's time to end. We're going to continue this next week, but what do we have now? We're going to continue more riots. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about this. But right now, set up. Right now, it's going to change. But right now, set up. According to Mikhail Chinuch, if you make a contract, I'm selling you my kidney. Good contract. A sale. You own your kidney, right? Open up, go outside, open up a, a kidney stand, sell your kidney, sell your liver, sell your eyes, sell whatever you want. And it's a binding contract. Because just like you can commit, just like uh, you can sell someone to hit you, according to Zevin, you can't sell your kidney, the contract is not binding because you don't own your kidney, so you can't sell it, you don't own. So seemingly according to Rakin, uh, according to Zevin, the contract about the kidney, and, that, and that's what he, that's what he wants. If Zevin was trying to say, that story of Shylock, that story of Shylock, if that, that, that contract came into Jewish court, we would have thrown Shylock and Antonio out of court. Okay? Clean other, we will continue this uh, next week.